That I will do. Should I check in? I have just one quick announcement huh? uh, before we get started. Uh, all the students uh, will have their certificate of participation in their mailboxes. I think some of you need it for you know, reimbursement and things like that. So every, everybody will get the certificate of participation in their mailbox. So let's get started for the day. Third lecture. Sorry. Okay, thanks. The structure of the recursion relation we derived from a contour integral. And we found that you can write the n particle scattering amplitude. Again, I'm using capital A here. This is the color ordered partial amplitude as a sum of residues of this complex function in the complex plane. And this is defined what is this function A of z? This is defined as a one complex parameter family of deformations of our scattering amplitude of interest, where we deformed the kinematics for particles one and two. Now, one of the questions that arose uh, in last lecture at the very end, when I didn't have time and I had to postpone it, was um, how do I know there's no contribution from infinity? So when I derived this formula, I took a contour and I pushed it off to infinity picking up all the poles you get along the way. Um, indeed, the pole at infinity is something you have to worry about. Um, in, in gauge theories and gravity theories, you can prove that there is no contribution at infinity. I won't give that proof right now because it's a little bit orthogonal to the, treat, uh, to the direction I want to go in, and it doesn't really teach you very much except the fact that there's no pole at infinity. Of course, you, uh, one thing that works is you can always use, I mean, you can always take any formula for an amplitude and check that it, it uh, has no pole at infinity. So I'll just write here. Um, it is uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, that shouldn't be there. So let's see. Um, thank you. Here we've shifted the lambda tildes. Here we've shifted the lambdas, and I just put the hat here. The hat is a conventional notation to remind us that these are the two shifted particles. Oh, and it's very important to emphasize, um, I picked particles one and two here, but th there's absolutely nothing special about that. You could pick, you could pick any two particles and do the shift um, equally well. It is a fact that you can always choose two shifted particles so that um, A of Z uh, goes to zero at least as fast as one over Z um, as Z goes to infinity. And that implies that there's no contribution from a pole at infinity. OK. Oh, uh, right. So the last thing I had done um, at the end of the lecture was to discuss where this object has poles. Where does A Z have poles? So 
So in our complex Z plane, um, it has poles anywhere where an internal propagator can go on shell. So it's important to emphasize, although we, uh, in, internal, it, although we, we, we try to avoid computing anything, uh, uh, sorry, uh, internal propagator goes on shell. Although we avoid computing anything by Feynman diagrams, it's important for us to always keep in the back of our mind that Feynman diagrams exist. So if we need to appeal to any knowledge or properties of scattering amplitudes, well, we always know that they can be written as sums of Feynman diagrams. And at tree level, sums of Feynman diagrams will always give you rational functions of kinematics. Um, and moreover, we know exactly where the possible poles are, because poles in any Feynman diagram come from uh, internal particles going on shell. So this gray blob means any So any Feynman diagram of this form, any Feynman diagram of this form has a pole at, and this is uh, just what I was writing at the end of last time, z equals one half p2 plus a squared over this funny bracket object. Um, it's important to notice that uh, because, oh, and notice, of course, that the external particles are given their fixed external ordering. Because I happen to choose particles one and two to do my shift, it's important that uh, one and two be separated in this diagram. So let me make a side comment here. Diagrams where uh, one and two appear on the same side have no pole. OK, so if you had a diagram like this, one, two, and then something else, three up to n, this propagator here is 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. But p1 hat plus p2 hat is exactly equal to p1 plus p2. So that's the important property of the shift that we discussed last time. It preserves uh, energy momentum conservation. So uh, if you shift both p1 and p2, this sum remains constant. So this propagator here doesn't depend on z. So this does not have a pole in z. Okay. So our propagator does not depend on z. So there's no pole. OK, so poles only come from diagrams where the two particles that you have chosen to shift are separated from each other by some uh, propagator. OK, it remains now only to calculate the residue. Yeah? Ah, well, uh, loop diagrams open a whole new can of worms, because in addition to poles, you have branch cuts. So the, the discussion gets much more complicated there. And um, People have looked at one loop successfully, but beyond that, these methods aren't really applied directly to loop amplitudes. There, there, there is a more sophisticated version of a re recursion relation for integrands of loop amplitudes. Let's compute the residue. Um, let me call this uh, ZK. Okay. Let's compute the residue of A of Z over Z at Z equals ZK. Well, 
going to be equal to, uh, so whenever you're calculating a residue, uh, you can always pull out anything that's non-singular, okay? So it's going to be uh, one over ZK, I can just pull that factor out, times the residue of A of Z, and this is going to be one over ZK times the residue of, let's call it A left, times one over P2 plus PK right. Okay, what have I done here? This thing, this thing is the piece of A of Z containing all terms that have this propagator. What I mean is, again, imagine you were to write down all possible Feynman diagrams that contribute to this amplitude. We'll never do that, but imagine in your head you do that. Well, they're separated into two categories. Some Feynman diagrams have this propagator, uh, sorry, this propagator. You know, there may be many other propagators inside here and inside here. Only these terms, only these diagrams contribute to that residue. Any other Feynman diagram that does not have this propagator uh, does not contribute to the, to the residue. It doesn't have that pull. Okay, now, when I look at the Feynman diagrams that do have this propagator, it's clear that all of them, that the entire sum over those set, that set of Feynman diagrams can just be written as the sum of all possible Feynman diagrams in this gray blob times that propagator times the sum of all possible Feynman diagrams in the right side, in the right gray blob. So that's what I mean here. In this formula, A left means this amplitude, literally the sum over all Feynman diagrams of this topology. And A right means the sum of all those Feynman diagrams. But those things are non-singular, so I can also pull them out of the residue. The only thing that's... Uh, Oh, and I guess there should be a hat here, because I want to have a z-dependence, obviously. Okay, so we have residue of this thing. Um, P2 plus PK squared uh, minus 2z, 1, P2 plus... K two. We had this formula last time. If you expand, uh, if you expand out this denominator, and you recall, so I'll put it up here. Recall, P two hat equals P two minus z lambda one, lambda two tilde. If you plug that in here and then expand it out, you get these two terms. And this residue, it's easy to compute, is nothing other than minus ZK over P2 plus PK. So this is the residue at Z equals ZK. So in conclusion, The amplitude we're interested in, 1 through n, can be written as a sum over k um, and let's think for a moment about what's the range of k. Well, uh, you need to have at least three particles on both sides, okay, Other, of both sides of this cut, otherwise you get zero. Um,
So the minimum value of k, where, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here's k. Yeah. So the minimum value of k is 3. And the maximum value of k, well, you need k plus 1. Uh, you need uh, k plus 1, the biggest value can be is n. So the maximum value is n minus 1. We have a left, one hat, uh, sorry, 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 a left starts with, uh, uh-huh, right, start like this, k plus one, k plus two, up to n, up to one hat. See, I'm reading it cyclically. You always read these things cyclically. So the left amplitude, reading it cyclically, is k plus 1 through 1. The right amplitude and then I've got this explicit propagator down here. And these hats mean evaluated at z equals dk. There's only one more slight subtlety uh, which I glossed over in that uh, I said, oh, when you look at any kind of Feynman diagram of this form, any kind of Feynman diagram of that form, the slight subtlety is uh, there are two such classes of Feynman diagrams because gluons, being massless vector particles, come in two polarization states or helicities. So you can have Feynman diagrams where the helicity coming out of this leg is plus or minus one. But then since it connects into that diagram going inward, the corresponding helicity there has to be the opposite. Okay, so in addition here, there's a sum over the helicity of the exchanged particle. Oh, and oh my gosh. And uh, yeah, I forgot. How awful of me. Call this. Okay, I forgot about the, um, I forgot about this extra leg. So let's use capital P to denote the momentum carried by that leg. By momentum, cons by energy momentum conservation, this capital P is going to be the sum of all of these. So, I apologize for that. The capital P here with helicity H, and I need a minus capital P here with helicity minus H. Okay, and that means that, that just means, so let me be explicit, capital P um, well you can take it to be P2 It's the same thing that's squared in the denominator, yeah. Okay, so the important form point about this formula is that these two amplitudes that you need to know here, they're always smaller than the one you started with. Okay, so it's a genuine recursion. If you want to know the eight particle amplitude, you can compute it via three particle amplitude times seven particle amplitude plus uh, four particle amplitude times six particle amplitude, et cetera. So you can always break everything down recursively until you run into the, your basic building blocks, which are your three particle amplitudes. So this recursion is seeded. You always, whenever you have a recursion, you need to specify the initial conditions uh, is seeded by the three particle amplitudes. Did 
that I, and I, I discussed their construction last time. Are there any questions about this formula? So this formula applies in any, uh, in any it, it applies for gluon scattering amplitude in any gauge theory at tree level. All right, let me tell you about the uh, simplest set of solutions to this recursion relation. Now, when I make that comment, I'm being anti-historical because I'm going to present results that were discovered in the mid-'80s, long before this recursion was known. Uh, the simplest amplitudes are those with two negative felicity and uh, n minus two positive felicity. These are called MHV. We used that word last time, but I, I never told you what it meant, and I promised I would tell you what it meant meant, and that's where I'm getting to now, um, which are given by okay, if, you, if you tell me that you have n particles, all of which have positive helicity, except for i and j, that have negative helicity, then the answer is really simple. It's ij to the power 4 over the cyclic product, 1, 2, 2, 3, up to n, 1. Oh, no, this should be n plus. It, these are all, um, all of them are positive helicity except for i and j. The, um, uh, the three-particle amplitude we talked about last time is a special case of this. It's really a useful exercise. Um, uh, the school is almost over, so I don't have time to assign homework. But it's a very useful exercise to check that these are a solution of this recursion relation. And it turns out to be very simple. Uh, if Suppose you wanted to check that that formula satisfies this recursion relation. You'll very quickly find that in this sum, in fact, in this double sum, only one term contributes. So no matter how, no matter how big n is, there's only a single term in the sum that contributes. All the rest are zero. And you basically get a trivial relation uh, between this thing for n particles and this thing for three particles and this thing for n minus one particles. It just pops out algebraically. So I encourage you to give that a try if you're curious. This is called the Park-Taylor formula. Um, or Park, Taylor, Baer, and Schiele. It was discovered in the uh, 1986, 1987, and it was really sort of the underlying motivation be, uh, behind a lot of amplitudes developments, because think about it. This simple formula encapsulates a huge, I mean, an arbit since this is for arbitrary n, it inc incorporates an in principle, arbitrary number of Feynman diagrams into one very simple compact formula. So the fact that Feynman diagram calculations are extremely messy, yet they add up to something so simple, should be some kind of indication to you that there's some deeper mathematical structure, and it's you know, to your benefit to figure out what that structure is. Because if you understand that structure better, it'll help you in your future calculations, or just help you understand better the mathematical uh, foundations of the theory. OK, so, um, oh, I still haven't explained the word MHV. 
sorry, MHV stands for uh, maximally illicity violating. So you can check that using the recursions that if you have all of the same um, If you have all the same helicity, or uh, only one negative helicity gluon, the amplitudes have to be zero. So the first case where you have a non-trivial answer is when two particles have negative helicity. Oh, and just a, a quick comment. Of course, parity invariant says that you can, you can conjugate everything. So, if you take this and do a parity transformation on it, you'll get n gluons all with negative helicity. If you parity conjugate this, you'll get uh, n minus one with negative helicity and one with plus. Okay, so there's a parity conjugate formula analogous to this that involves the square brackets instead of angle brackets. So just to be absolutely clear, I'll write the formula for MHV bar which says that one minus two minus I plus J plus N minus is equal to I J to the fourth over one, two, two, three, up to N one. All right. There's a little bit of a, of a puzzle here because if you look at the four particle amplitude uh, with two positive and two negative, this will give you a formula, that will give you a formula. They look nothing like each other, but secretly they're equal to each other, okay? If you do like one plus, two minus, three plus, four minus, on the one hand, this is equal to two, four, the fourth power over one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. But on the other hand, if you use this formula, it's equal to one, three to the power four over one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. So secretly, these two are equal to each other, though it's not obvious. And I bring this up now because uh, remember some of my motivation in the first lecture was saying that we want to adopt a set of variables um, that are more naturally suited to, uh, to providing exactly the right amount of physical information to specify a scattering amplitude without any redundancy. Here we're starting to see that even these spinner helicity variables, while they are useful, they don't yet completely achieve our task. Because, I mean, this is a relatively simple example. If you start going to an eight or 12 or 15 particle amplitude, it's easy to start writing various different formulas that look nothing like each other, you know, that go on for pages and pages and pages in Mathematica. And they don't look anything like each other, but they're secretly equal to each other. That's a hint that we're still not using absolutely the best variables, because if you're using the best possible variables that exactly cover your kinematic space with no redundancy, and if you're checking two rational functions whether or not they're equal to each other, it should be obvious that they're equal to each other. You just subtract them in Mathematica and, and do expand, and you get zero, okay? That doesn't happen here because these variables are still constrained by overall momentum conservation. So um, the next thing that we're going to do is to um, alleviate that problem. But in order to, um, yeah, actually, let's just jump right in. So this just takes us to the uh, variables called momentum twisters. So let's just recall the lambda lambda, ter lambda tilde variables uh, satisfy Q 
squared equals zero automatically. And nicely encode, nicely encode uh, gauge invariance of the epsilon, of the polarization tensors. So that's what dis I've discussed last two lectures. However, they are still constrained by a quadratic relation. Okay, if you have any n-particle scattering amplitude, Oh, and I, di I didn't mention this. This was implicit in what I was mentioning before, but we always adopt a convention where um, uh, in, any, in any scattering amplitude, all momenta are pointing outward. So there are no minus signs here in our um, energy momentum conservation relation. So the point is the lambda lambda tilde variables are still constrained and they satisfy a quadratic constraint. And that's a little bit annoying. So again, going back to this example, uh, it certainly is not true that this is identically equal to that. No, that's not what we're saying. What is true is that this is equal to this on the locus where this momentum conservation uh, is satisfied. So what we would like to do now is to adopt a new set of variables which um, trivializes this momentum conservation relation. So the first step in that um, construction is to define what we call dual variables, or region momenta. And, oops, uh huh. Okay. There's unfortunately some ambiguity in the literature. Different references use uh, some people put I minus one, some people have an opposite sign there. Um, so the point is the following, that if you parametrize your, if you introduce variables xi that are related to your momenta by this formula, then they will automatically satisfy uh, momentum conservation. So then sum i equals 1 to n, pi, is automatic. And all indices are, are, are cyclic. So Pn, by this formula, means Xn minus X1. Okay. Now, um, you, you gain the fact that momentum conservation is automatically satisfied. There's, there is still a tiny bit of redundancy left in the X variables, because if I hand you a certain collection of momenta, they don't determine the overall, they don't determine where the origin is in X space. You always have the freedom to do an arbitrary translation in X space. But uh, that's fine, that's no problem. It just means that anything we calculate will have uh, necessarily translation invariance in X space. These, of course, uh, you know, these are, everything here is a four vector. So there should be some indices. All right, so the uh, question. OK. Yeah, so it's very important in, in everything that we do now, it's going to be very, very important that there is a cyclic ordering. So 
the first lecture where I said that we can decompose any amplitude um, even at loop level if we focus on large n, we can decompose any amplitude into a sum of, of, of uh, primitive objects, each of which has a well-defined permutation or cyclic uh, structure. Okay, so let's contract. So the next step in our construction is we're going to, well, let, let me say, uh, let, let me write the words before I do the calculations. We'll appeal to the correspondence between points in Minkowski space and lines in P3 and null lines in Minkowski space and points in P3. P3 is complex projective three space. Okay, so those are the words. Let's do the formulas now so that you see how the construction works. Uh, first, we take this formula and we contract it with uh, lambda. So when I, when I use the word contract, I mean um, multiply by um, epsilon a b lambda b on both sides. Okay. This, of course, is lambda i a lambda i tilde a dot. So on the left-hand side, we're going to get zero because, oh, there should be an i there. I apologize. On the left-hand side, we're going to get zero because the, uh, the, the epsilon is going to kill. We have lambda i anti-symmetric inner product with itself, so we get zero equals. And now I'm going to use a somewhat uh, shorthand notation because uh, uh, I'm a little lazy to write all the indices. You'll see what I'm doing in just a second. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm just too lazy to write all the indices. This thing has an A and an A dot. In, this has a dotted index and an undotted index. The dotted index I'm displaying explicitly there. The undotted index of this and the undotted index of that are contracted with the epsilon symbol. So the general rule here is anytime, anytime two common indices are contracted, they're always contracted with the epsilon symbol. But I'm going to leave that implicit rather than having to write it every time. Okay, so I'll just write it here once. Xi lambda i a dot means epsilon a b xi a a dot lambda b i. Okay, so we get this formula. And this formula tells us that these two things are equal to each other. Okay, so let's give them a name. Let's define u i a dot to be equal to that thing. Okay. Now, let's collect the four components for each particle i. Collect the four uh, components, lambda 1, lambda 2, mu 1 dot, if, okay. okay. This is not an I, this is a 1 with a dot over it. Oh, and each of these has a subscript I. 
Let's collect these four components into a single object. D I. Um, I. Where I now ranges over one, two, three, four, and I, of course, ranges from one to n. Now this at this stage, we're doing violence to Lorentz symmetry. Okay? because we're, we're combining two objects that we don't really have a, a right to combine, something that transforms under the left-handed SU2 of the, uh, of the Lorentz group and something that can, conforms, uh, transforms under the, the right-handed SU2 of the Lorentz group. We're combining them into a single four-component object. But we're going to see it's to our advantage because we're going to get something that exposes an even much bigger symmetry. Okay, we're going to get a, see a symmetry that, that rotates, makes arbitrary rotations in that four-dimensional space. Um, now, an important point is that uh, Z, these Zs are naturally variables in complex projective space. So note that Z and TZ are indistinguishable for any non-zero complex number T. And that's because in this defining relation, if I simultaneously multiply all of my mu's and all of my lambdas, um, if I simultaneously multiply all of my lambdas and all of my mu's by a factor of t, I mean, this equation is still satisfied. So in other words, um, there's an ambiguity by an overall rescaling. And that is the very definition of P3. complex projective space P3. And I have a formula here that I should show. Yeah. Oh. No, no, you don't need to scale the x's, but I, you, uh, on, on this blackboard, I have not written the lambda tildes. Of course, you would also have to rescale the lambda tildes by a factor of 1 over t. And in fact, the formula I'm looking for, which I have right here, here we go. Um, from that, from the definition, from these equations, you can work out what the lambda tilde has to be. Uh, I'll just write it. Lambda tilde i has to be equal to i minus 1 i uh, mu i plus 1 plus i, i plus 1, mu, i minus 1, plus i plus 1, i minus 1, mu, i, over i minus 1, i, i, i plus 1. Okay, everything here has an a dot. Okay, where did this formula come from? This formula comes from the fact that we know, uh, well, you have to reverse engineer a little bit. You, you know that the x's are related to lambda and lambda tilde by this way, and mu is defined by this. So it gives you a system of equations, and when you solve them, you'll find that the lambda tildes are given by this formula. Um, and let's check, let's check that this satisfies the correct 
uh, scaling property. So if we simultaneously rescale all the lambdas and all the mu's by a factor of t, the numerator here will scale by a factor of t cubed, and the denominator will scale by a factor of t to the fourth. So indeed, this gives us the correct scaling. Um, uh, note, lambda tilde scales like 1 over t lambda tilde as required. Keep uh, p equals lambda lambda tilde unchanged. Are there any other questions? So where we are so far, uh, let's just review. Um, if, if, if you give me a, a, a the, 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 the um, if you give me the kinematic information uh, of a scattering problem, I can encode that. Uh, I can encode uh, that in endpoints in P3. Now I want to explain the reverse. I want to I want to show that if you give me endpoints in P3, that I can reverse engineer the kinematic information. So, um, Okay, so suppose you give me n points uh, in P3. Then I'll define the lambdas and the mu's by defining the lambdas to be the first two components of each z and the mu's to be the second two components of each z. Then consider the following equations. Mu i a dot is xi lambda i a dot, and mu i minus one a dot is xi lambda i minus one a dot. Okay, these are almost the same equations I have over here, but not quite, because uh, it's important that I, I have the whole collection of equations at my disposal. So the point is here, here I've written the two equations in which xi appears, okay? So all I did was I took this relation here and shifted i by one, okay? So the, the equations hold separately for each i, so I can just take i and shift it by one, and I get this. So, so the point is, given a collection of lambdas and mu's, Define xi to be the solutions to these equations. Okay, these are four. Uh, each x is four independent variables, uh, and this is a set of four linear equations. But we can derive an important consistency condition. Okay. Having found those solutions, um, they satisfy um, mu i equals xi lambda i a dot mu 
i equals x i plus one lambda on a dot. Okay, so here again, I've reverted to the original uh, set of equations by shifting the indices. So it's, I, I think I've said this too many times, but we have the whole collection of equations. So you give me a whole collection of z's. I write for each i this set of equations on xi. I then solve all those equations simultaneously to find all of the xi. Well, they, that collection of xi satisfies this, these equations. And now if you subtract them, you get 0 equals, and I'm going to use some slightly abusive notation here. I, again, this means contracted with the epsilon symbol. So this would be epsilon a, b, a, a dot, a, a dot. Anyway, the point is, uh, we conclude, or this, this formula implies, that the determinant of xi minus xi plus 1 is 0. You see here, the only, way, the only way you can find a non-trivial solution, think about this like a two by two matrix equation, right? Pull the epsilon into there. This is a two by two matrix acting on a two component column vector. The only way you can have a non-trivial solution to that is if the determinant of this two by two matrix is zero. This implies that the determinant of pi is zero which implies that pi mu is null. So we've proven that a collection of n ordered points bi in P3 contains exactly the same amount, same data as a collection of n uh, cyclically ordered, uh, I'll just put ordered, uh, null momenta in Minkowski space satisfying uh, overall momentum conservation. But a picture is worth a thousand words, so if you haven't appreciated this derivation, let's just draw the picture that goes along with this. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I will, that's an important point, and I'll discuss that in just a moment. So. You, well, I'll discuss it now. You can do this construction in any quantum field theory you want that has massless particles um, that have some natural ordering. So in gauge theory, in the planar limit, we have a natural ordering because of the trace structure. Okay. But there's something very special about particular quantum field theories which is that they exhibit the full symmetry of that P3 space that you're not talking to. But not all, not all quantum field theories will exhibit that symmetry. So, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that. Yeah, yeah. It's not quite symmetric product because you, you can't allow, yeah, I, I know, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, we're, we're going to get exactly to that point. It's a space mathematicians call uh, configuration of endpoints in P3. And that's exactly the kinematic space um, that we're going to be talking about. So here we have Minkowski space, and here we have P3. So if you talk about a scattering process in Minkowski space, 
you have a collection of uh, null momenta, like this is P1. Uh, so it, this is a four vector in Minkowski space and it's null. Okay, I can't draw null on the blackboard, but of course it's null. Um, now because of overall momentum conservation, I can put all of my P's back to back and they'll fo form a closed polygon. So this is a, a, a polygon with uh, null edges. So each edge represents a null vector in Minkowski space, and it's a closed polygon because of energy momentum conservation. The vertices here are the locations of the um, x's. Okay, so this would be the point x1, the point x2, the point x3, the point xn, etc. And the, as I mentioned earlier, there's an overall ambiguity. There's a translation invariance in this space um, because it doesn't matter where, you know, the, the p's are defined by differences of, of x's. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. I. This is inconsistent with my early, earlier labeling. Uh, this should be x2 uh, because p1 would, yeah. It's a little confusing because different references uh, use uh, different uh, conventions. Um, okay. Uh, over here in Minkowski space, the p point is similar. We have a collection of uh, points, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. And then we have a collection of lines that you can draw between successive points. So this is the line 1, 2, the line 2, 3, Oops. Line three, four, etc. And eventually this will close as well. Over here you have Zn. Okay. Oh my gosh, I didn't mention it. Um, Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Well, if you look, I didn't mention it before. I, if you look back at the equations here, these incidence relations, the, I didn't use that word yet, but these are called incidence relations. If you look at the set of all, if I give you a collection of x's, okay, uh, like if I give you a single x and you look at the set of all lambdas and mu's, that satisfy the incidence relation for that given x. It's a set of linear equations. It, it, the solution is a line. So each line in twister space corresponds to one of these points x. So the line here, 2, 3, uh, corresponds to the point x2. Line 1, 2 corresponds point x1, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, p1, a complex line, yeah. Okay, so I'm out of time now, uh, x1, x, uh, x3. Okay, I'm out of time now, so I just drew the picture. Uh, um, so, so the point is the following. Uh, the, the, the only important point you need to take away from this is that the Z, the Z variables provide a free parametrization of exactly the kinematic space for massless scattering. 
if you, if you draw n random points in Minkowski space, it's not guaranteed that they will be null separated from each other, okay? Like, if, if you pick, if you're looking for a 10 particle scattering amplitude and you pick nine random null momenta, and you let the 10th momenta be given by momentum conservation as minus the sum of the first nine, it's almost guaranteed it won't be null unless you made a spectacularly lucky choice. So this geometry is very rigidly constrained by requiring each of these to be null and requiring it to be a closed polygon. Here the geometry is completely unconstrained. You draw n random points, boom, 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 n random points in P3. Then you connect one point to the next by a line. Okay? And then you follow the algebra, which is on the blackboards here, to reverse engineer. And you'll find that each line here automatically corresponds to some point here, and those points are automatically null separated from each other. Okay, so in my next and last lecture, we'll, we'll be using these uh, momentum twister variables um, extensively. So, thank you. <laughs>